So, I'm Alex Tarazas. I've been at PL for three months now and uh, just diving into a lot of these things and learning a lot of these issues. Um, I think one of the first things that I did when I got to PL, I was like, when do we start crunching the data, you know? And then uh, that's why I was really fascinated by Bacal Yao um, and just really a proponent of that. So, uh, try to cover a few of the economic issues that we've identified so far. So, you know, in order to do a good job like this, I think everybody realizes that we have these stakeholders and if we're going to model this system, we would need to understand that. Uh, this is probably not everybody. I saw some others listed earlier, but certainly the storage providers, compute providers, who initially will be the same people, if I understand it correctly, clients who can be both data scientists, but can also be sponsoring organizations, um, a lot of different types of clients, and I think that could be broken out further later. Validators who check the data, check the compute, and then data owners, and that could also be processed data owners. So if somebody does something interesting to some raw data, stores it on the network, that could be another interesting stakeholder. So we try to do uh, what we call a value flow, try to understand where the value flows between all these participants. And certainly the clients uh, are basically sending fees to everybody, um, at least in this initial uh, model. Um, the validators are giving the clients verified results. That's what they want. Um, and the clients are sending the verifiers some fees occasionally. Um, storage providers are exchanging storage and data. And sometimes the compute providers are creating large data sets that would result in a storage contract. And that's an important aspect to this of why they would want to do this. Um, but also they're probably making some money from doing the uh, contract. Uh, stimulus is, you know, minting of new coins, but other types of st stimuli, that's not just what stimulus can be. It can be uh, reputation, other value that they um, can inject into the system. Uh, so please stop me if you have other arrows you want to list. I think this is a very incomplete set of arrows, uh, complete set, incomplete set of value flows, because uh, we're just getting started to understand this, but I think it's a good start. Stimulus could be, you know, making new tokens, could also be uh, improving your reputation or having a reputation system that, uh, you know, gives you the stars, it gives you the uh, reputation. Cool. And that's what we're going with this. So incentives are not just about tokens, but they're also about staking uh, to signal that you have compute available. So you know, you're saying, hey, I'm, I'm here. Please pay attention to me for compute um, validation so that you could be slashed or you can um, you know, show that you're in the game. Uh, you can lock drop your storage tokens to join. Um, product market fit and uh, reputation is contextual and you know, we need to have strong use cases to, to build on that. So we looked at the scheduler of the Bakul Yao um, and I think the way to think of it is as a multi-dimensional marketplace and so there's a lot of components to that, a lot of factors that, makes, that make the decision to choose one provider or to choose a series of providers, distance to data, the ability to store your results if they're large, um, the compute capabilities. These are very, I know that it's very early in the Bakul Yao uh, model, but long term, I think we need to look at a lot of these points. So price point, obviously, maybe uh, different providers want to offer different prices to do compute, uh, so that'll be competitive, track record slash reputation, and uh, geographic location for compliance. Somewhat similar to data, distance to data, but um, not exactly the same. So then we wanted to look at the performance met uh, metrics. So the amount of compute, you know, how do we know Bakul Yao is doing its thing? How, how do we know that it's succeeding? And so, you know, if we can attribute to Bakul Yao the amount of compute that's being processed, that's being used on the network, which should be pretty easy to do, um, then we can see what its effect is, what it's, what it's giving us. 
um, unique data uh, uh, data sets. For example, combining Landsat data with other forms of geospatial data. Yeah, a lot of data might be sitting on the network not doing anything. If we increase the access and use of those data, um, that's a success, that's a win. Uh, tokens exchanged, um, number of nodes offering compute. These are very basic, but they are good measures. And then new storage generated. As I mentioned, a lot of these processes will create new data sets, and those can be quantified and we can show that we're um, having success there. So I think everyone's seen this triangle more than a few times today. And, um, you know, we did a survey of Web3 COD systems, and I saw some really nice work on that earlier today as well. But I think, you know, one, that's, one of these three corners that's being ignored a lot is the privacy. And this could be a really nice sweet spot for us um, because of all the uh, protected health information and other types of data that um, you know people aren't paying attention to, uh, that aren't secured necessarily on Web 2 type approaches, but could be secured more on Web 3 if we can figure it out. I think a lot more of the action seems to be along validation and performance. It seems to be where the focus is. It's not like we have to commit to just one of these models and sacrifice the third <laughs> corner of that, you know, we could have it uh, tweakable so that you could choose which model. If you're doing biomedical processing, you can emphasize privacy. So we don't have to have a one size fits all approach to this. It'll take some flexibility in the programming uh, model. So um, I don't know why that's not moving. <laughs> oh. Okay, one second, slideshow, there it is. There it goes. Okay, yeah, so I don't think it makes a lot of sense to go over some of these um, other uh, COD systems. I think we had a good review of that earlier today. Um, I think it would be interesting to start to place them in that triangle. Uh, pyramid and, and hopefully we can do that as a discussion point now. Um, I think again most of them seem to go along that validation performance metric and again so if we're not addressing the privacy or if no one's addressing the privacy aspect of this this could be one of our verticals be a nice fit. The pain points. So this may or may not be true. I mean, sh um, storage providers will have to divert some of their resources, some of their efforts to become compute providers. Hopefully, it's a holistic you know, improvement for them that allow them to diversify their revenue stream, possibly. Um, maybe some of their equipment is sitting around unused at times, uh, hopefully. So if the programming model uh, is flexible enough to allow them to run processes um, at their leisure or just in time, that would allow them to utilize these unused resources a bit more. Um, so also the compute providers have a different uh, compensation model than storage providers. It's more of an on-contract deal for them, right? So um, they don't get to participate in making new block sets and things like that the storage providers might get the chance to do. Um, they're just doing the fee for compute. So, so it's a little bit different. Um, this is one that I've experienced and it's early, but um, you know, it's hard to find where the data sets are that you want to use on the network. And so I think that alongside the creation of the technology, we need to make sure that people can find these data sets, that users can find the data sets and do something with them. So, you know, just going into this blind, you'd be, well, what am I going to do? You know, I'm, I'm trying to answer a business question. I want to know where to find the data uh, that can help me answer that. And so it's a big sea of data, and it's very hard to boil it down and find what you want, you know? And so, I mean, I did a lot of geospatial stuff, and that's why I'm so fascinated by Landsat. So I'm glad that people are talking about that as well. But, you know, I need to find open street map data. I need to find other bits of data to combine with that so that I can do my machine learning workflow 
and to get something interesting out of this. Um, another pain point, I think, uh, and I wanted to bring that up earlier, and it looks like you're starting to address that, but you know, when I've done data science, usually I submit the job and go, oh crap, <laughs> what did I just submit, right? And so you, then you gotta crash out of it, you gotta figure it out again, and also, you've got to be able to check your results. And uh, so I think that's tough, you know, with the bits of text and things like that, it's easy. But if we're talking about an image data set or something else, you know, you have to have a good way to access those data and to check them out. Um, and then I think that validators may have a hard time distinguishing between, you know, a programmer's mistakes or other types of errors in code and um, in data and actual malicious behavior. So I think that could be a, a tough one for the validators. So let's talk about Landsat because I think it's a great um, initial product uh, or initial data set for us to work on. I think people have been talking about it clearly. But I um, wanted to mention that um, we get a whole new Earth scan every 16 days. So this is a giant data set that just keeps coming, you know, the, the pipe is just filling up all the time. And so what people want to do with Landsat is look over time. And so um, I had a hard time finding the Landsat data on the network. And, you know, then when somebody says we have Landsat, you know, that means that maybe they have one data dump from one one scan, this kind of thing. But if you really want to store Landsat, you need to store a whole bunch of data over time. And most of the useful use cases are time-based. And I'll also mention that 70% of the Earth is covered with clouds in, at any one time. So when you talk about cloud processing, that's exactly what we're doing here. Um, so people spend a lot of time and a lot of effort pulling out these clouds, like how do you do it? Um, what you have to do is go back one time point and hopefully find the same pixels that don't have clouds and then shove those in and then try to make a data set that's really five scans long, you know, by the time you get there. And so we have the cloud belt. Everybody loves this volcanic picture. Um, that's just there for show, but these clouds are a big problem. And then there are other, a lot of other processes that people do on top of that. So cloud removal, optical corrections. One of the things that's very deterministic and very easy to compute is this vegetation index. And you know, as a user of Landsat, I just wanted the vegetation index. I wanted to see the disturbed ground. My personal, uh, my use case back when I did use Landsat was to find disturbed earth and try to find new construction of new buildings, and so make a building index. And so this is something that uh, I feel that we could do, uh, or we could find somebody that wants to do that too. Um, but these are the um, derivative products of Landsat that are of interest. So it may behoove us to have Lands or to have um, Filecoin compute some of these things and then output these as useful data. You know, like, there's no reason for everybody to do cloud removal on the same tiles. We could just do it once. And so, and we had some discussion about how to track these data assets. If somebody does cloud removal, they could become a data provider then or a data owner and, uh, and sell the data. I'm not sure that's quite legal with Landsat. Um, we'd have to figure that out. But... Um, storing it would be really useful. And so change detection, another really pretty easy, nothing's really easy in geospatial data, but change detection is just taking two images and finding out if they're different and finding the pixels that are different so you can hone in on where they are. So very easy process, could be very useful to the geospatial community as a whole. And then I just also want to emphasize that Landsat is a really good fit for the mission of Filecoin. I mean, it's some of humanity's most important data. Um, you know, we're in an environmental crisis, so this is something that everybody really wants.